Welcome to the History Unplugged podcast, the unscripted show that celebrates unsung heroes, myth busts historical lies, and rediscovers the forgotten stories that changed our world. I'm your host, Scott Rank. Probably one of the most interesting and complicated of the Founding Fathers is Henry Lee, also known as Light Horse Harry Lee. He was the father of Confederate General Robert E. Lee, and he rose to glory. He fought in the American Revolution. He helped ratify the Constitution, gave eulogies for Washington and Patrick Henry, but ultimately ended his life in ruin due to very poor decision-making and impulse control. Henry Lee got the nickname Light Horse Harry Lee due to him being a brilliant cavalryman who played a crucial role in Nathaniel Green's strategy that led to Britain's surrender in Yorktown. He had incredible success as a cavalryman despite having no military experience before the Revolutionary War. He was a close friend of George Washington and gave the famous eulogy of first in war, first in peace, first in the hearts of his countrymen, which is widely quoted today. He was a strong supporter of the Constitution. His arguments led Virginia, the most influential colony in the soon-to-be country, to ratify it. But he experienced a downfall due to land investments that led to bankrupting his family. He was the victim of a political mob. He was beaten with clubs and his nose was partially sliced off and hot wax was dripped in his eyes. And in order to escape creditors, he ultimately wandered the Caribbean for several years, becoming an isolated, lonely old man with no company whatsoever, and accumulates more debt and can only pay it off by swindling a widow. And he comes back to America completely alienated from his family. And many biographers of Robert E. Lee think that his father's lack of control causes him to become such a hyper-disciplined person. So to get into this figure, I'm talking with Ryan Cole, who's the author of the new book, Light Horse Harry Lee the rise and fall of a revolutionary hero, we're going to look into the life of this greatly flawed but hugely talented leader and orator and politician and landholder who still has influence on the United States today. Enjoy this discussion with Ryan Cole. Ryan, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I'm looking forward to discussing Light Horse Harry Lee. Yeah. And to start out with Harry Lee, I had not encountered him very much. I think the only time I did was as background for looking at the Civil War, where Robert E. Lee is given his little biographical snippet. They'll mention that his father served in the Revolutionary War and was a confidant of Washington, which is somewhat somewhat ironic because his son is behind a major figure in the effort to separate from the United States. But typically from what you've seen, how is Harry Lee remembered? He's remembered broadly as, I mean, you just, you said it really, you kind of summed it up. He's remembered because who his son is primarily, and he's remembered because he was, uh, not only was he one of Washington's favorite um, horse soldiers during the revolution, but he was a, after, and, you know, even before, because he grew up around Washington, because his father, Henry Lee II, served with Washington and Virginia's legislature and Washington's diaries record staying at Leesylvania, which is where Light Horse Harry Lee grew up, uh, the Lee Plantation in uh, Prince William County in Virginia on the Potomac. Uh, his connection with Washington after the war as an informal political advisor uh, and friend, those are the things he's remembered most for. And an extension of that, he wrote and delivered the eulogy at Washington's a funeral. I hesitate to call it a funeral because Washington's body wasn't there, but memorial service in Philadelphia after Washington died in 1799. Um, that's the, that featured the phrase first in peace or first in war, first in peace, first in the heart of his countrymen, which has endured. And that's kind of cemented the connection between Washington and the elder Lee. Um, if you get beyond that, those connections. He's not particularly, um, uh, he's not someone who is fondly remembered, I would say, because he lived a very complicated life. Uh, He was someone who had a great amount of potential in terms of his background. He came from one of Virginia's, he came from one of the prominent families in one of the most important colonies and then states. And he had a a promising political career, a military career, and he ended his life uh, destitute and brought down his family along the way. So he's been held up for a fair share of criticism from those who have gotten beyond the connections to Washington and to Robert Lee. And there's also been quite a bit of, I would say, uh, psychoanalyzing Robert via uh, Henry. His name is, real name is Henry Lee III. He would have been mostly called that in his life. 
Light Horse Harry was uh, applied later, I think maybe even after he had died. You won't find any instances of him calling himself that or being addressed that in any correspondence. So I, I will maybe go back and forth in this conversation between Henry and, and Harry. So it's the same person in case there's any confusion. But there's there's a lot of a uh, fair amount of trying to understand Robert's motivations by looking at his father, his father's behavior, what type of trauma that would have left on him. Um, so that that's about it. You know, there haven't been a ton of actual biographies written about him. There's one from the 30s, another one in the 60s, and then Charles Royster's work in the 80s is, I think, probably the most significant. He wrote a, a uh, kind of a, a, not a biography, but a, an attempt to understand the revolution and the early years of the Republic by looking at Lee's career and finances and downfall. And there have been more recently been a couple studies of Lee's military career. But this this book is the first birth to death biography in decades. And we try to get beyond just the connection to Robert and the connection to Washington and try to understand this really big and, and a lot of times confusing and perplexing, but also important life. Well, before we get into his life proper, I wanted to ask again about something you mentioned that he's mostly been used as a tool to psychoanalyze Robert E. Lee. And for listeners who don't know, psycho psychoanalysis was a approach to history that produced a lot of ridiculous history books in the 50s and 60s using Freudian psychoanalysis saying, oh, by you know being Freud and analyzing this person, we can explain what they do through psychology. And some of it is useful. Most of it gets pretty ridiculous. And um, it really dates a lot of these histories terribly. But how did psychoanalysis get used uh, with Harry Lee as the subject? Did they say that Robert E. Lee's motivation can be explained by his father's failures, or is it something else? Robert E. Lee conducted, let's put it this way. I, this is something I said the other day. Robert E. Lee, if you study him and you know about him, there's a, there's a sense of, um, I wouldn't say bloodlessness, but th- there is a sense that you get of a man who's, who's, very much, who's wielding almost tyrannical self-control uh, and discipline over himself. And I'm not just talking about his military career, but I'm talking about fear of debt, um, his faith, his dedication to his family, um, his, you know, uh, care for his wife and his fretting over his children, not knowing him as he was away from home. And that is, if you look at Harry, almost the opposite. Uh, he's someone who had almost no control over his life, lived his life, um, uh, as one historian said, in, in um, high relief. It was a grand life. I don't think he had a lot of impulse control. And one of the, the, the angles that people take is that Robert saw this. He saw that his father's inability to, to you know, control his investments, his father's absenteeism from both his wives. Lee had, uh, Light Horse Harry Lee had two wives. Uh, the fact that he barely even knew many of his children. I think you can look at that and say that Robert, even though he spent very little time with his father, remember he was born relatively late in Harry Lee's life and Harry Lee was either in jail or in exile or on the run throughout most of Robert's life. You could look and see that Robert knew about his father. He understood the disgrace that he brought on the family and he made an effort to live his life in the exact opposite fashion, particularly the personal stuff. The military is another subject. But, and, uh, you know, I think that's, I didn't want to get into that in this book, other than maybe one paragraph, because the book's not about Robert. Right. It's about, about Harry. But, I, I mean, I don't think that's, you think you're right. A lot of this this type of analyzing is, ends up with ridiculous um, uh, conclusions. But I don't think it's that outlandish to say that the son looked back and saw the father's behavior and made a very, uh, you know, an effort to make sure that his life and his family life and his finances were not, you know, what he, what he, the, the disgrace that he saw his father descend into because of his own inability to control, um, his urges, his life. And, um, it's it's a pretty striking contrast, really. All right. Well, let's give the subject its fair due. So let's look at Harry Lee. He's called Light Horse Harry Lee because of his accomplishments as a cavalry officer. So mm-hmm. tell me about that military career. And it must have been pretty good if he's a 
confidant of Washington as a young man? How did that all come about? I'm going to repeat myself just a little bit, but he grew up, he would have grown up knowing Washington. Washington would have been a guest in his home growing up. So there was already that connection before the war, before the revolution. And Lee went to uh, what's now Princeton, College of New Jersey, and he studied under John Witherspoon, who's another founding father, who transformed that uh, college into kind of a factory of uh, churning out young intellectuals, revolutionaries, a lot of young men who would later have careers of distinction come out of there. And Lee is studying with James Madison at the time and Aaron Burr, among others. So he comes, he's kind of gets indoctrinated. It's, it's really a hotbed of radicalism in the years leading up to the revolution. And Lee is there and Lee soaks in it and understands the kind of philosophical underpinnings of the American Revolution when it arrives. And he leaves there and the intention, intention is that he's then going to go to England and study the law, become a lawyer. There's some Lee family connections in London. But the, the war intervenes, obviously, and he, that's not going to happen. And the alternative is then revolution. And he has already studied history, you know, as a... As a boy, he was already uh, interested in it and um, reading it avidly. So he sees history, understands the history of warfare. He's already an ambitious young man, and I think he sees the revolution as an opportunity, as many, many others did too. Hamilton is the Alexander Hamilton is the same way. John Lawrence, they see the war. They are both philosophically dedicated to the cause of the revolution and the idea of the independence for the colonies, but they also see it as an opportunity for fame and glory, you know, to last throughout the centuries. Lee certainly, I mean, he said this, there's no beating around the bush. He, he says this in correspondence quite often, but the trigger is he is at Mount Vernon for a dinner in 1775, shortly before Washington departs for Philadelphia. Charles Lee, unrelated to the Lee family, an English soldier of fortune, very eccentric, is also there. These are two of, would have been two of the most um, distinguished soldiers in the colonies. You know, Lee, or Washington was already uh, famous for his participation in the French and Indian Wars. And Lee, who's fresh out of college, is there with them on the eve of, you know, the beginning of the American Revolution. And I think this obviously must have really fired his imagination and ambition to, to join the cause. And shortly after, he actually writes a letter, writes two letters, I believe, to, to Charles Lee, asking him if he can make his mark with Lee. Lee uh, Charles Lee ends up being you know, real, basically the second in command of the Continental Army, much to his chagrin. He wanted to be, he wanted Washington's spot. And so Lee already at that point is thinking about this military career. It's a little slow in going. The, he never, the letters don't get to, to Charles Lee, so nothing happens there. But he ends up doing volunteering in the local militia in, in Prince William County. And then when Virginia decides to raise some cavalry regiments, he ends up getting control of one of those. But you're already in this, this point, I should say. This is an um, incredibly ambitious and aggressive young man who's not afraid to, to wield his family connections, because we should say cousins um, in a different part of Virginia, in the northern neck of Virginia where Stratford Hall is, where Lee will end up living. There's another set of Lees led by Richard Henry Lee, Francis Lightfoot Lee. These other Lees are heavily involved in the revolution and the move away from Great Britain. And they end up in Congress and they're pretty significant political players in this era. So Lee has these family connections, which he is not afraid to use ruthlessly to, you know, find clothing for his men and arms. And he's, Drilling them, and it's important to remember this is a guy who had no military training, no formal military training. His father would have been the head of Prince William's militia, but that's about the extent of his um, military background. So he's a self-taught soldier, uh, as many of the revolutionary heroes are, and he's busy in Virginia, you know, with Virginia, his his troop in Virginia. About this about this time. It's originally in the northern theater of the war, the understanding was that there really wasn't need for mounted soldiers because of the terrain. And at the time, Washington is, is you know, is sieging Boston. There's why would you need cavalry soldiers? But once the siege is lifted, there's the kind of changing of mind, particularly with Washington. And he decides they're going to need cavalry. 
at that point, there's a request for regiments to be added.